Da na 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 Welcome to the occasion of my second first Tuesday reading following the American presidential election on lawyer Roy Cohn's townhouse doorstep. <clears throat> Tonight, in honor of the fans of this just past professional baseball season, I'm joined by a warrior who lived to regret the organized sport of perpetual killing. I will start where the last reading finished on page 132, near chapter four's end. And to embrace the ideal that reading is worthwhile work, this reading should conclude around an hour from now where the next reading begins. Chapter five, page 152, inside or even outside Florida's historic Sanford Memorial Stadium, where the professional baseball player Jackie Robinson was so deridedly ridiculed he couldn't finish his run to first base. Denied first base after World War II, nearly a complete century, generations distant from our country's uncivil war. Right now, page 132 is happening three miles south of here, downtown in an East Village restaurant. The protagonist, Hank Greenway, is in Moscow tending his hammer and cycle messenger business. Hank's friend, Terry, is the present narrator. She is sharing dinner with Greenway's friend, the conservative lawyer, Mr. Trainer. They're discussing an incident with her boyfriend covered in the film of the previous reading. Mr. Trainer, the lawyer, had met Hank through Dr. Armin Hammer the Hammer and Cycle's initial corporate sponsor. Hank had met Dr. Hammer towards the end of chapter one. So that's the short read from chapter four. Five happens in Moscow, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, another facade of words hiding an elitism. If this portion doesn't sound as exciting as the previous reading, it's where the series has landed. And as the wild and crazy guy, comedian Steve Martin, was recently quoted saying in a New York Times book review interview, sometimes a book builds to one memorable sentence. Terry, our present narrator, is speaking across the restaurant table to Mr. Trainer. Actually, this is Terry um, speaking. Actually, I was dazed and wondered what it would be like watching someone not fight back and be ripped apart, which wasn't happening because it was just a conceit-fueled drama. Men defending us for themselves in the clutches of the powerful master jealousy. George's eyes boiled like tonight, except matter. Hank said, Gray, beat me down. If only we sold the witnesses tickets. So George cocks his head, reminding me I'm his ally, and says, who's this little white guy anyway? George can portray the, serious, the sincerest confusion. Poor George pled, who is this guy? We've never seen before. So Hank smiles like this is a goof to get us through, and that upsets George more. In George's world, there couldn't be a friendship, so I had to try to explain to get him through the mess he caused. I said, George, I'll do the introduction. Hank, boyfriend George. Right now, George is afraid because he doesn't have a good reason for being here other than an unspoken claim to just be driving by, which could be significant, except George never bothers to explain himself before he's asked. I stomped my foot, interrupting George's interruption. That wasn't true, that he was getting us something from Balducci's. So I yelled at him, you always ignore me, and that victim expression tacked to your face doesn't get it either. This isn't your way home. 
and you never pay for anything. So George rears his baffled head, imagining he hadn't heard me correctly because I must be the one exaggerating hysterically. Certainly George must have had time to calm down since I left the restaurant, but not enough to listen to reason. He always had this way of taking in just enough information to rely on his shrewd business sense to jump on the ruthless move. He shrugged his shoulders at the crowd like he didn't know, and I accepted my role as the witch. I screamed, you weren't looking for me when I left the restaurant fed up being bossed around. George was always incapable of listening, especially when his eyeballs would dart after his internal dialogue, disabling him from engaging with anything I ever said. Exhausting. I told George he's exhausting. I said, you only followed us because you saw me with someone else. Because when you're upset with me, you always run away expecting me to wait. He yelled, Terry, again. So I yelled, Terry, nothing. I'm gone. Then come on to Hank. But George kicked Hank's front wheel with his boot and stared in Hank's face, pretending, that is, pretending as if that was his asking me if I was taking Hank with me. And Mr. Trainer, yes, this bothers you. George was mad at us earlier. Maybe he's outside waiting somewhere on 2nd Avenue now. I said, I'm not looking. Whereas Phil said, maybe you should and understand his jealous attitude. Sometimes facing truth requires dodging it. I said, his intolerance, this is my life. He never understood that. My cautious days with him are long gone with the wind. How could I miss that attitude? And he was given many second chances. I saw him the next day while poor Hank didn't even, ex didn't even exchange numbers. Disgustingly polite, but I'd had enough of men. So how did you get rid of them, the men? Hank stepped back diplomatically, and I raised my voice to drop the verdict on George. I said, I'm doing what I want, and asked Hank if he saw the police. Phil smiled. I was wondering where they were, but I wasn't. George says, stop it, Terry. Let's not joke. I can take you home. I yelled, no, and could feel how the audience was gripped. Then Hank said, good night to pass the hat. We'd be a hit in Washington Square. Of course, that pissed George off more. But Mr. Trainer had a comment. Terry, aren't you exaggerating? I said, I remember exactly. Not just George's possessiveness, but his mean child's attitude. Then George took it out on his tires and burned rubber out of there. And guess what Hank said? I hate cars. He doesn't hate cars or blame drivers who are the ones that have to change their minds. What's done is done, as Hank said. The automobile conspiracy was just too luxurious for this world's kings and queens to refuse speedy door-to-door -door convenience. I smiled. But what Hank said when George left was, you losing you could be the worst thing that, that could ever happen to a man. So my answer to Hank was, men and their possessions would crack me up if it wasn't unfair. Mr. Trainer cracked. That's what marriage is. I said, we weren't married. And isn't marriage more than a commercial contract? Phil said yes, an extended, verbal, formal, emotional contract. So then where did you two go? I said, I sent Hank home and I went to mine. My independence mattered. He watched me for a distance, then I assume rode off after I went in the subway. But probably fantasized how tough he'd they'd be next time which is why last time I just walked away. Between moving cars, yeah, well, like a, vo a lawyer avoiding surprise, I'm sure I crossed the street when it was predictable. Phil laughed. I think you dropped out of law school. I nodded, affirming the obvious, and asked what else I had done that night. Phil said, you ignored George. I said, 
Hank knew that nonsense and had nothing to do with me. What did Hank say? He said nothing really, seemed happier if that's possible. I said Hank deserved more attention. Thanks, I feel worse now. But Phil said you did no wrong in his eyes. So I said, salesman, aren't you? Phil said, lawyers are a little everything. Like women, I said. Correct, Phil concluded, and asked which train I was taking. Then we walked to Broadway and Houston, and Phil asked a bit more about my life and why I had chosen that Second Avenue, second story storefront Indian restaurant below 6th Street where we ate, whose kaleidoscopic colors I was fond of from childhood before my family left for the South. I told Mr. Trainer I came back because this was where opportunity supposedly was and prejudices not so nearly fully expressed. I got tired of hating people on the inside and don't understand how anyone can. Terry ends her narration and Mr. Trainer narrates now. <clears throat> Smart woman, I made a good hire. Chapter 5, we begin. Hank, Hank Greenway will start the narration and be taken over by one of the Moscow partners. Chapter 5, Hank Greenway. An uncertain shadow outside the attic that he is stuck in, in the outskirts of Moscow. An uncertain shadow outside pasted me to this spot hours ago. Mikhail warned I'd neglect my duty on my watch, and, and my head did hit the floor, waking me up. No pleasing him. Why an apparently huge perimeter is taking hours to search. Worse, I didn't wake less irritable from having slept at least a moment before my head smacked the floor. It's just this awful, awkward exhaustion that's extreme torture. Now, Mikhail, Hank's first hire in Moscow, takes over the narration. Mikhail. Terry and Mr. Trainer are good people from Hank's nice life in New York. However, Moscow was odd letters, goofy shirts, and receipts he gave curious garage parkers who stare at the artistically hand-drawn sign on our door. That brought some business because a lot came through the Mejda Narodnaya Hotel that Dr. Hammer owned. But we weren't making money. Glad and fed had been communism, while Hank's general ethical attitude remained our stumbling block. On the phone, he'd repeat his motto, motto to never look in a package, then refuse mysterious blank envelopes that didn't quite fit his plan. He let what happened be happenstance. Our initial business that found a following of sorts was queuing in line that developed from errands for my mother. Clients discovered us in lines that could last days. Then a pale old desist order arrived, demeaning the activity anti-socialist. Lines were meant to spend free wasted time on when the country stole each other blind, kicked our children. Everything was a kickback, but a stand had to be taken against exploitative capitalism. So permits and licenses banned us from doing that service and threatened to close us if we were ever seen in line again. Imagine paying to wait. Today we of course realize, duh, everything costs money. But back then socialism's token facade was a shadow of doubt. The problem with our waiting was being young, tall, and handsome. We weren't legitimate line standers ignoring stock that consistently left by the back door. Relieved of our competition, government stores continued as they always had. No, government stores continued as they always had, catering to the elite until, as expected, a few months later down the road, 1991's fewer products 
meant that Bonham dropped right out of anyone waiting in line. Still, citizens waited, aware idle warehouses were full to achieve the most private gain while their outlet couldn't get them to believe nothing would come. A dismal economic climate at the level of enterprise Hank chose pursuing. Lines didn't make money either, and we were just doing something when there was nothing to do. Still, Hank said he didn't want to waste Gorbachev's time with a personal problem. So I ripped the bureaucratic speed trap from his passive hand. Greenway, I said, use this to our advantage. I intimidated him with my size and backed him into the wall. Sickle to Kremlin, put name on list. You know how to wait. I even said, looking up at the pencils that Dr. Hammer had given him as a gift, that Hammer made decades ago when he first started business in, in Russia. Sickle to Kremlin, put name on list. You know how to wait. I even said, looking up at those pencils. Hank made another speech. It's a mistake for government to be parents. You probably don't understand what this means, but you don't have to be a Heritage Foundation conservative to believe in individualism. It's important we're on our own. I don't want the president coming to me for help. Why go to him when a few more customers is what would solve our problem? Hank took the desist notice to a magazine that saw a commercial angle for themselves that became my fond memento behind my computer now. Our small corner ad in the now defunct listening magazine reminding me there's a straight story to tell. Open. 24 hours. So, to try to continue somewhat seriously, business begins at its pinnacles opposite, while some restart again at absolute nadir, where the hammer and cycle was December 10, 1990, when our disputed sponsor, Dr. Armin Hammer, died at 92. That Saturday night, we surprised Hank in the driveway on his way out and made him return with us to the office where he paced the lot for 20 minutes while we drank without him, each brainstorming the meaning of Hammer's death in our own way. We sat on the floor to have less far to fall, laughing our heads off, eulogizing the departed fart. When Hank heard enough, he came in and took Leonid's bottle. Crap doesn't count, he said, and poured just for himself. Then said, until I hear something of value, only I drink because I thought of this. He held up the glass and began. Yeah. Hank held up the glass and began his toast to Hammer. I didn't want to, but now realize it is my honor to commemorate Dr. Hammer's commendable support of Culture Minister Yekaterina Fertseva, who before her own death was deposed from her prestigious office for accepting Hammer's capitalist largesse. A bribe I know he would have hoped to share as generously with actual workers if nationalism and corporate evolution allowed. I think he at least said he thought his project's Soviet workers received a living wage. Hey, I'm bullshitting. Who knows? Even when not drinking, Hank provoked Sergey, who said, sham. Bribe KGB favor to polish old friends' capitalist image. Da. Everyone has enemies that let Fertseva take blame. But ask yourself why culture minister would need money. 
She had good career. Publicity served to preserve communist sympathizers cutthroat capitalist image. And Hank agreed. Yeah. Since Lenin's autograph, Hammer's life was a photo opportunity. Public life is image. The larger it is, the more it is shaped. Hank refused to pour for Leonid and Sergei laughed and said, toast ruthless opportunists who stole our cultural heritage of paintings and relics for years. Years before we were born. How was he not KGB hostage or friend? <clears throat> Customer, Hank burped, having drank twice more in the meantime, as his wobbly eyes now seemed different from the rest of his head. Passing six swigs, Leonid reached for the bottle while the rest of us were amused. Hank had become vodka talking slurring his words under drinking's full swing. Hank started. Ammer at heart was just connected businessman. Whoopee to capitalism anyway. I buy he was wishy-washy, but, but, but it doesn't matter to me if his father made him sign his American Communist Party card. Information the former 18-year-old would want heard from other sources. I just don't care what Hammer did. He thrived on deals. Working with, for, and against anyone and everyone makes the most sense. How folks have always lived. Last week, Mr. Trainer sent me Freedom of Information Act letters signed by America's FBI czar, J. Edgar Hoover, that Hoover had sent Americans, senators, and congressmen, etc., warnings, warning them not to associate with Dr. Hammer back in the 20s, 30s, and all. Nothing is more effective than negative PR. Hammer probably wasn't just a double agent, but triple infinite agent man going for the one out to prove himself worthily retired to sunny California. Case closed. Even dead, there's half a chance Hammer works for a flipped coin. Big businessman. Satisfied little people are fooled. It's not funny there's no room for saints at the top. Then another big swig swayed Hank more dramatically. He demanded, let's all rise and drink again, refusing us, insisting, no, no, not without a sing significant toast, not you guys, no drinks. He threatened to kick Sergey and stopped Leonid by locking the bottle in the desk drawer. Then he reached under the desk for the hammer and sickle glued to the bicycle wheel and crawled out saying, it said Hammer poured millions in this country he never got back. Maybe. But the story of the world is quid, pro, and quo. Sure, Hammer has background he can't account for. So what? Sergey said, end it. I want Leonid's bottle. Hank took it out. Hank took it out. And another swig. And put the bottle back and said, no. Tonight honors his death. What is your reason to celebrate? And after some silence, Sergey sat up and propped himself up against the wall. He said, okay, toasted lightweight, praise. All of, always full of it, aren't you? I will tell you, Dr. Hammer called me daily because he phoned me every day. Let's celebrate my deal with him my verified Swiss bank account for taking over from you. But no matter, until I work that out, if you stay, you work. We are moving into Hammer's building downtown. They won't care if we take over their mailroom from the bottom up. Sergey laughed. You cannot possibly work for him now. He is dead. No, I see your eyes move away. You don't accept. We made no money with you. The dead man offered. 
He thought he had the strength to take you down before hospitals sent him home to die. Sitting on the floor by the desk, Hank drank again, holding the bottle tight. As usual, thinking in his own world, looking at the pencils. Hank said, the telephone cord was Hammer's umbilical. That's not worth a drink. I won't toast his ego. I never wanted to memorialize Hammer's name in a way Occidental can't. We can't separate, separate our names, but we can from the money. Then Hank's backward gulp went in a long sweeping motion such that now, up to that point, you could have thought no one died. No longer. A month earlier, we got Hank to a party where he drank that time to fit in also. He pointed at the sky and screamed, pterodactyl. But Greenway wasn't a drinker. He was an exaggerator. This time, imitating Soviet-style drinking to forget feeling guilty for associating with the powerful. We should have left and let him walk and work it out on his own. Because drinking and sitting led to that last exaggerated gulp when the weight of his head and that bottle pushed him back so far that the base of his skull gashed precisely on the corner of the desk. He was too slow from the alcohol to panic and laughed at the absurdity. <laughs> then, when the pain became bad enough to not refuse an available doctor, Joseph had coincidentally caught one when I called the front desk. Watching on his private screen, he had a minute to prepare since both the park parking lot cameras were always on us with the door generally kept open for oxygen. Upon protest, Stalin's namesake Joseph grinned that he never watched. The doctor arrived briskly, patting his prop, his medicine bag, and Hank's babbled Russian wasn't so bad. Considering the doctor was supposedly English and in town for a symposium. The doctor said, I travel with my bag. Being late with a story will make me a celebrity at the auditorium. Right. Let's solve this. Quite a hole you made for yourself. Quite a hole you made for yourself. How did that happen? All of us laughed, so the doctor said, don't move, and held Hank's head still. Your damage doesn't seem as bad as the horror. Is this from a, from a fight? Doc, with himself, Sergey said. He is haunted by his American demons. Then... Sergey revealed the next bottle from his backpack that Hank hadn't known about, causing hilarious laughter among the group. So the doctor told Hank not to speak. I spoke for the bottle. We drink the hammer. He didn't push you into desk. Unfolding his stethoscope, the doctor said, I met Dr. Hammer at a London museum. Cocktails. Impossible to turn your head. You have to look at celebrities. In public, the rich seem always on, more lit up than the rest of us. But I saw Dr. Hammer's glass filled to nothing he didn't sip from anyway. Must have done all his tying on later, alone, in the limo. Or, Hank said, could have been on a perpetual internal chemical rush. Ah! Then he screamed from the peroxide. Ah! Leonid asked, You say Hammer was sober? The doctor ignored them both. The, the bandage must be changed tomorrow. Joseph can. And immediately Hank interrupted. No. The doctor scowled, aware. You know he's dead. Don't pretend. Sergey answered, He knows. This is Hammer's memorial. 
The doctor stopped Hank from touching his skull. Excuse me? Hank frowned. Uh, sorry. Please tell your hammer story for Dr. Hammer's eulogy. I went too far drinking. I'm the joke. I thought they had one bottle. There's probably four more. They'll sleep on the floor and be in my way in the morning. And you'll go back to England. Scotland. Very good. Please, sir, your story and my wound. The doctor took the package off the bandage. You've been to Scotland? <clears throat> Hank said no, but my name is from there, and I seem to have stubborn habits. <clears throat> ah, very good. The doctor smiled, humored. My patient, the one who wrote my wife and I into filling the room, told Dr. Hammer I was a doctor. Dr. Hammer told a small group a tasteless joke about how if Americans only invested the attention in medicine they have doctoring finance, even the full poor could afford to be sick. Everyone laughed, so that Dr. Hammer touched my arm and told me he knows and gives such and such to charity every year. Well, Hank said yes, depending which director's votes need influenced. The doctor, the doctor appeared in Hank's eyes. Again, tell me how you were in business with him. Hank started to leer, but his head hurt. He said, we're not in business. This is his basement. Uh-huh, the doctor replied. Uh-huh, the doctor replied. Thinking with us, what's the difference? He tried explaining, too. Was. This was Dr. Hammer's basement. Hank tried to stand up, but the doctor kept his hand on Hank's shoulder. The doctor was firm as well as skeptical. The Scottish doctor said, I think you had a lot to drink. Lie down for me, please. The desk is fine. Hank, Hank shoved things off and put his head on the notebook. The doctor sat forward in the chair and cleared his throat. Mr. Greenway... Usually, I have patients sit up when I talk to them, but you are revved up and your heart racing. Relax. I could give you no drugs. No more alcohol. No? Why weren't you careful the first time? Hank smiled. Doctors coined slogans reminding us hindsight is too late. You guys sure are at, the heart, are at the heart of the truth of the matter. That's why disaster is when doctors aren't really in charge of the medical enterprise system. Can you send me a bill? The doctor, packing, smiled. Don't involve me. I wasn't billing the hotel and certainly not you. Hammer and cycle. Think highly of yourself, don't you? Your name spells money, Hank Greenway. Where's yours hidden? Everyone who travels through the Mesut of Narodnaya talks about the nut in the basement. Now that the old man kicked, you'll have to make your claim. That's how things usually go. First come, first serve. Largest bankroll laughs loudest. Hank said, amusing, doctor. Paying rent here. It's my exclamation point. The doctor knew things. He said, petty cash. You can't afford the actual cost of basement space in the Mesh de Narodnaya. Joseph said you need to make a deal. Hank shook his head, so the doctor said, how else? What we wondered, too. But Hank had enough. Joseph likes describing my inevitabilities. Screw him. Doctor, are you staying or going? Hank closed his bag. Joseph said you've never known what you're doing. 
Joseph said, you never known what you're doing, the doctor said. Now you hurt yourself trying to forget in a bottle. Mr. Greenway, the bottle is for sullen reflection, not making everything fuzzy. That's nothing. There's nothing in numbness. Joseph said there is money in a Moscow bank while you wait in line for vegetables. Hank said, we gladly wait for vegetables. The doctor didn't care. Joseph laughs about you, called you simplistic little capitalist. Hank said, I know, and crossed his arms looking at the ceiling. Then the doctor looked over his glasses as a sizing up a mental state. Then us the same and said, Mr. Greenway, how long have you been drinking? Hank turned toward the pencils and said, since my teenage realization being drunk is pointless, the doctor stayed. Hank continued. Then a couple years later, alcohol entered my early university years. I tried experiencing some key to the Soviet mindset in Florida by dra driving to a large bar that at least in my time was that area's crossroads. I was 436 in 1792, Castleberry. It was always virtually deserted late Sunday nights when I went to stretch what was left of the weekend. There were two long rectangular bars that easily kept six tenders busy on those kinds of nights. Wall to wall alcohol, but different when I went late and empty for my ceremonial Sunday night vodka and orange juice screwdriver. Over the year, I worked my way up to two glasses per Sunday night and made it safely back down to one by the time I stopped. I never had that drinking to forget problem like tonight, though I did go out to a bar after John Lennon was shot. Anyway, those were somber, reflective nights then ended sometime after my first and second year American history professor and I stared at each other in the dark from across opposite ends of the bar. Quite a distance for indoors, but we were the only ones there except for the lone woman bartender. I sent the message back through her that the low grades he'd given me were just the incentive I needed. He was the first historian to draw a line I had to get over because until him, I'd never gotten less than A in any history course. But for his Western civilization class, if you didn't get 80% correct on the first part of the test, he wouldn't grade your essay so you couldn't score better than a C for the exam. I made the final B from the next three tests but I couldn't get the average up to A, which never happened to me before in history. I was a shy punk and got the hell out of the bar telling her to tell him I thought he was one of my most important instructors. He was sloshed, and I was lucky his career had been a part of my life. Two Ds in U.S. history I didn't study for and a push. He gave me the lower grade because though I heard every lecture, I wasn't applying myself. I couldn't believe it happened and let him give me a D the second time too. You, whew, school, it's like magic, you know. This whole idea everything can be taught when everything can't possibly be known. Shaking his head, the doctor repeated the light in the eyes thing again and said, did you eat? Hank said, no, probably not. Tonight, my nourishment was as it was back then in Florida, marketed as alcohol sophistication when it's all there is to do besides the movies you can't afford more than once or twice, especially if you drink. I adapted to the drinking culture around midnight Sundays until I wasn't interested anymore. I suppose.
and under two year process, I compressed into tonight because I have to drink pure vodka so Leonid might consume less. Then over dramatize myself into a desk that's where it should be when a head comes toward it from where it shouldn't. The doctor told us to stay with him, that there was probably nothing to calm Hank, Hank except sending him back to the environment he was raised in. <laughs> Hank thought that was funny too and left after the doctor used the elevator. He took the stairs and brought back two colas as a chaser, he said. He read about how undercover cops wake their spirits when drinking ever cover in bars, artificial pep. The doctor asked us, asked us to keep track of Hank, though all our effort was necessary to hold on to the floor itself. So by no means had our company's brainstorming over Hammer's death caused a blizzard. We were just ordinary people surviving on vodka, suffering our ancestors' legacy in the far gone throes of where laughter at oneself is the most fun of all. Sergey started up again. Greenway, Toast Dr. Hammer, Socialism's Capitalist Demise. Well, before either crippled head could prove anything, Plakhanov intervened. What? Who's Plakhanov? I must be so inebriated on this intoxicated memory of being that drunk, I made the name up. No, Plakhanov's real name is Irving Myrovovich. But we called him Plakhanov because he was a founder of Russian Marxism in the 1890s when Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky were just young punks in school. Having carried crap in Afghanistan, our Plakhanov started Moscow's first doomed courier service, Korinya Vesya, cart everything. Plakhanov said, Sergei is angry, his Swiss account is probably gone, but money is not in Greenway's eyes. Look at him. He fears Sergei's deal. He accepts failure as fate because of what success means. He can't compromise, but we have to. Everything comes in time. His way eventually, but we have to take advantage of our opportunity now. I have to say, I vote with Sergei. Hank's style was to wait and listen while Sergei's was to never shut down at all. Hank said, for once, Plakhanov, the old name has wisdom. Time is now. Be honest with him. You encourage his ignoring authorization. The American game, getting away with it. <laughs> Hank grinned. Has that anti-authoritarianism ring to it, huh? Sergei ignored him and told me in Russian I was more foolish than Hank that Gorbachev's diluted power would be no help either. And though Hank was right, wanting to do everything ourselves, it was especially true because Greenway was no help. Sergey always, no, sorry. Hank always knew what Sergey said. He mostly spoke English so the group would reveal themselves in Russian. Hank stretched, groaned, and pretended to jump for the pencils, screaming, Permit! We don't need no stinking permit. A business license should require separate permission for everything. Queuing isn't illegal. Loitering in line is a government-sanctioned custom. See how government's logic is balanced teetering on a needle's head, dooming us when its weight falls behind anything. Sergey said, Hammer paid us for, Hammer paid for your pro-business eulogy and you sold us cheap. 
Lakanov nodded yes and said, Hammer said we'd be millionaires. Hank frowned. You should have hung up. Sergey rocked to his feet and touched the wall. Ha! Now two doctors. Hammer and the one who just left. Both called you peculiar. We are forbidden to look in envelopes and toolboxes are problem. Of course carpenters work on smugglers' homes. Who, hell, who else has money? Hammer laughed. What kinds of businesses does he think you can afford to pay you, he said. Hammer said Mikhail was right hiding Carpenter from you. Plus, Hammer gave me another number. Sergey looked at the phone. This man is rich, connected. Hammer said to not trouble you. He said he couldn't believe he fell for your scam in hospital. I think complaining about you made him weaker and hastened his death. Once he said any slogan would have gotten further than bottom up and coughed <sighs> forever. We finally just hung up. Your involvement made it impossible for anyone else. He was right. Opportunity leads to others, not extra time in basement. Hank looked at the wall. I always hung up the phone too. Sergey said, Hammer talked. I listened. Last month, medication made it possible for him to repeat all of it, all over again. It was difficult for him to speak, but I could feel how much he hated you. And he wasn't your enemy while you made him ours. At least he didn't die thinking that was true. He had fixed everything. This idea was a dream come true for him. That first floor messenger service money was ours. Hammer said in all his years impressing people with less money at the opera, he'd never seen a bigger prima donna than you. Instead of planning retirement funds, Greenway refused a multi-million dollar advertising campaign. So... We are being clear tonight. This is not your decision now. Monday morning, we start managing Occidental Mailroom downtown. Employees left intact will do the work while we take turns observing periodically. Instead of our barely received daily bread, Dr. Hammer offered me your job. Said rich men don't live with regret. They die with them. I don't plan to regret. Making money is not dishonest. <clears throat> Pretending concern, Hank said, you took my job? Sergey smiled. Curious. Hammer offered all of us money. Me, Mikhail, Lenin, Leonid, Nikita, Plakhanov. All of us, when any of us took over. You are stubborn, you told doctor. Corrupt opportunists would not matter if you gave up on your own. Hank looked at the floor. Sergey slapped the wall. Nothing. You have nothing. We have nothing. Seriously. You know what Hammer complained about most? People don't know your beloved Hammer and Cycle exists. He will repeat and mumble. Household name, household name, over and over. You should be household name. Uh, to make your success official, he said he put your name next to nothing in his will for spite. Hank, Hank smiled and pushed the desk to the doorway to get close and smell the lowest pencil. This lead and wooded sculpture are enough for me from him. Benign history. Sergey sighed as Hank sat back down cross-legged on the desk with his head against the doorframe, staring up at the pencils. Hank said, my bond with pencils is from childhood. Once scribbling with an ink pen, on the TV room floor, it occurred to my father to stop on his way in from outside on his way to 
and through the dining room. He sat on the couch and leaned in toward what I was drawing on the floor and made sure he had my attention. My father told me his generation grew up with the pencil and how he was more comfortable with one despite the rapidly changing worlds requiring the smoothly faster pen. But the pencil had the eraser's magic and felt more agile in his hand when thoughts had to be words on the page. Of course, even pens have erasers and liquid paper is common now. But what my father left me feeling was the sensation of civilization advancing in trends. Discern from the pencil's example as evolution and communication. Hey, now I remember asking my mother why he always used a pencil. She told him, do I cling to the past too much? No, don't answer that. It's good to have memories you want to remember. My mother even had me learn the magic of thought translated for your, through your fingers, playing the typewriter's keys. But we're, but we're just toasting. He owned in this country these pencils, those factories. Too bad the Bolsheviks couldn't respect individuals. Their only incentive was competition within the Communist Party, the largest commercial monopoly ever invented. Sergei looked straight at Hank. Hank, he said, what could be different? What is honest? Change just brings more of saying. What is, is. Hammer said your principles are nuts. We could have already been paid without working. And those tools Mikhail carried were not used in any crime. Hank stood on the desk, turning to peer out the doorway, then stepped out, leaving Dr. Hammer's jargon and jargon and loops eulogy of withered reasoning and regurgitated explanation. Regurgitated explanation. Then after Hank popped his head back in the doorway, he reminded us, calls behind my back, conspiracy under my nose. Thank you for making me want to walk. Which was how Hank generally ended meeting, meeting off in a huff. He cut off the first carpenter's discussion with logic is like whittling. Carving till something's not useful doesn't mean it wasn't thought about a lot. And it was also Hank's technique to wear the group down, gnawing on each of us individually to get his votes back to remain technically in charge. Interrupting his nightly sojourn to take one of us along, Exer exercising futility because we remained in Hank's den because he sab sabotaged the Occidental mailroom takeover. Executives took immediate control of the country all over the world, and Hank refused to talk with anyone. Even a grunt from him, and Hank could have been given a token of service, something. But Hank just grinned all the way through, believing the value of what we get is nowhere near what we'd give up. The executives battened down the hatches and every secondary acquaintance got less than Hammer promised. Those who received something <clears throat> had a lot more influence than us, thanks to Hank. Hank didn't care shady connections would have meant nothing to us when shade was all there was. The reality was Greenway's big dream was pie in the sky, gravity always splatters to earth. Passive nice guy capitalism has a track record for finishing last. When messenger service was backed up with packages at Christmas, Messenger service 
was the company Joseph ran in the lobby that should have been our office. When messenger service was backed up with packages at Christmas, Hank treated us to an afternoon in a restaurant because unless Joseph works, he doesn't really need us. We were never ahead to rent anywhere else because Hank turned down the only commodity worth a dime to carry, money. Even rogue KGB carried money. Contraband made millions while we weren't worth the proverbial taste Hank claimed everyone was due. Except for the money, messenger service was a nuisance for Joseph while we were in business to take those problems on. Even Hank knew enough to eat wasn't getting ahead when payday packed truckloads of icons crossed the border daily bringing back special things bought with real dollars like whiskey. There were conveyor belts of finance in the Soviet Union while Hank promised something would come when we're the most trusted. But we couldn't help wanting money for under the mattress. I was caught once covering some smuggled, fr some smuggled freight's vaguely legitimate leg from the airport and we just ceremoniously shrugged in the office without a wall, since Hank didn't care to sweat the small stuff. No matter how often he said no, no one was fired for initiative, so it was as, a, as an amusement center that Hank stayed nominally in charge. But things had to turn around. Despite Hank's ignoring people, doing things for Sergey on the side, and that we all had enterprises because we would make more organized. On our own, we voted. Hank had to always have his beeper whenever he left, and even while in the office, just in case. Sergey seconded Hank's appeal against the motion, but since no one complained, Hank had to accept the losing end of that bylaw. Raised to think politically active is automatic and pointless. Having our votes actually count was heaven. So though Hank saying idealism was amusing, there wasn't enough business. When real money was made, that happened, nor stood any nonsense. No, Hammer wouldn't have let that happen, nor stood any nonsense that wasn't business. Such was the extraordinary cost of the beepers. The day after their delivery, sh short a confiscated pa <coughs> pair, another player, a salesman, ha Hammer probably sent, from a European team, slipped through and mistook our marginal enterprise for one to skulk around. Sergey confronted him first, so he was already suspicious. Here, maybe. Yeah. Henri asked us to equate his business of beepers with food since everyone communicates. No. Then he acted, acted as if he failed to see Hank disbelieved a salesman starting from the basement wasn't a cheap alibi. Amusement could not replace money that wasn't in our, in our pockets. So by spring, I was nominated to interrupt Hank's walk and alert him to coming changes. I caught him leaving the parking lot, and he turned to me saying he wanted to feel how it feels without it. And he was tired of the lecherous device and insisted I take his beeper. But I said, I cannot violate company trust. I can duct tape it to you if, so you're not tempted. Hank said, it disgusts me stuck to it. And he picked up our pace along the river in the direction of Red Square. It beeps and interrupts trains of thought, making the last one hard to keep. Know what I mean? They go off in the office because everyone has, it's infuriating. It's infuriating 
hearing beeps when nothing's going on. So they don't wait in the office and take too long to respond. They call someone else first while I wait. Where do they get money to call someone before me? I'd rather messenger than be in the office. I said, thank you. Company has no complaint. Take summer off. We decided that no matter how conflicted our noble leader is, our differences of opinion came together for the sake of the company. We decided that no matter how conflicted our noble leader is, our differences of opinion came together for the sake of the company. Now it's your turn. We want you to ride your bike. Ride all day if you want. Like these guys. Ride all day if you want. But face it, we voted. This is not a coup. You will remain monarch. But Sergey negotiated closet space larger than the one we now with new bank on ground floor that wants our logo and their billboards corner to advertise their following Dr. Hammer's wishes that we make money. Hank, I am sorry they are dumping that clunky Duchamp design of the hammer cycle on the wheel. And just going with the hammer and sickle wheel. But there's nothing on paper says you own us. We should have made money all along. That is what concerns us. Did you know the hotel's doormen are paid just to watch briefcases? Who cares why guests hide them as long as it's for money? Though Hank's eyes had followed mine, Listening, his mood darkened at just the thought of discarding his useless to jump ready-made. That got him. Otherwise, he'd have shut up if it was just about bankers. Using his accent, Hank said, Hammer's, partly, Hammer's party really came together after Sergey revealed I turned down millions in advertising. I left and y'all stayed. Passed out in the morning on my return. I faced the rebellion then by taking Sergey for the first walk, and he gloated how I unanimous, unanimously lost the vote. He didn't care that was why I brought him to walk. He loves political, political victory and had to savor it. Hank, this is official now. I'm telling you, this is official. And Hank grinned. I'm still happy without Hammer's influence. I declined the blank's offer. I raised my voice. Please, incredulous. Now you're spying on us? And we're still in basement? He said, I know. Hardly a treat. But we're genuine. <clears throat> I flipped my hand in the fed up gesture and said, stop rationalizing. We have no business. Hank said, I was voted out already. <clears throat> Remember? I said, good. No succession crisis. Then a dog across the river caught his attention and he laughed and said, no, I won't physically fight. But you want something from me? Demoting me again is hardly a reason to interrupt my walk. <clears throat> I didn't say anything. Hank shrugged and stopped to hold the river railing. Then said, Hammer couldn't protect Sergey, but he inspired an entrepreneur. I would have liked, I would have liked to have heard their calls. I said, don't wander off. But looking at the dark sky, Hank said, the salesman Hammer could offer anything. Anyway, all of you have outside interests. I preferred not to interfere. But people could someday be fond of that name. I'm only protecting a legacy. Hank, I said, you are bragging as you have since before the eulogy when you said hammer folded, bent, and mutilated words. But we never met him 
and will still make more money from him than you. You are riding bike Monday and walking upstairs. Hank smiled. Sergey said that too when we walked in the January blizzard. Want to hear what I said? <clears throat> Hank giggled. Your consensus form from before I left the I saw that your consensus formed before I left the party, euphorically under the influence of the pencils. I wanted the group to formulize, formalize right then. I knew there was enough to drink. You know, America began in the saloons. Plus, as I confirmed to Sergey in January, I believe in your rights to independence. But as Sergey could have told you, and I told him, Call yourselves courier maintenance. The hammer and cycle stays with me. <clears throat> then Hank threw a rock in the Moscow River. That Monday, Sergey was delivering fresh milk. How could I stand in the way of that? How much corruption would I uncover before giving up? Sergey didn't lose a beat. I guess I don't like it, but I'm proud. In Hammer's case, though, he was in love with the son of, son of bitches game power. Peculiar negotiating your life by the concerns of dead men. <clears throat> Hank liked looking over the river and skipped another rock and said, Power repulses me. The glistening, ruthless texture of the modern world that has evolved. What's evil is so refined. Time theoretically smoothed the seismic historical shift rocking Hammer's youth that we have supposedly grew up foreign to because that's how history changes when new people see things entirely different. I wasn't born at the bottom below Pitt Street. I was sheltered and narrow, narrow, narrowly raised in my small hometown under my parents' tutelage. Early century events taught one young man to exploit all the opportunity he could, while this product, me, of the mid-century, learned to wait, watch, and wonder how we'll face this conundrum of plenty not being enough. This great complication, the distribution of wealth, beyond the abilities of human mathematical genius. What political, Mikhail narrating now, what political ideology had to do with his losing control of the company couldn't stop another rock or his explanation. Hank gave a short snort after mathematical genius and continued. I caught snippets of the broader cultural revolution being smoothed over by America's national newsreader, Uncle Walter Cronkite. See, the thing is, even as a kid, it was obvious the authorities smoothed out the news for public consumption. Propaganda. Advertising, there are no lines. We're lucky there's room for any independent thought at all between dissent and submission. Yet I think it's hard to know when we're actually having fun, so our being entertained is easiest to understand and <clears throat> The next rock was slung with some oomph. And Hank said, Hammer grew up without radio when I didn't have to. But I didn't listen to where the revolution was on the radio during that time in the 1960s. The music that made it to television was sanitized so bands could get the gig. Or it was just too late at night for me to watch in the beginning. I was so young and naive, I asked my first friend in life if his older brothers knew what the generation gap was. 
And their reply was it was about boyfriends and girlfriends instead of indentured marriage. Of course he didn't say indentured, I think. But I debated the point and admitted my parents weren't everyone. <clears throat> marriage is a fascinating pact. Some commitment agreeing to be miserable together when just breaking up is hard, married or not. All divorce is emotional. Then Hank stopped in his delivery and his speaking and from throwing the next rock. Then he said, you know, I think we're missing something seeing two people's experience as a barometer of moral decline. Casting stones was supposed to be the dark ages we're climbing out of. It's offensive that anyone on this planet is so self-righteous to condemn anyone else for anything. Hank smiled. Ah, well, calamity falls forward. We learn from our mistakes. Hammer's generation bore the brunt of the 20th century's seismic grading as it shifted against the 19th when commercial notoriety cultivated the entertainment of our time so that now notorious behavior is ordinary life in the modern world. <clears throat> and so the Hammer and Cycles next read, don't know when that is, but we're concluding now. Black lives matter much, much more 